Bibles, if you should be still there, Luke chapter 6, uh, Brother Rob read our text for this morning. Um, I told you last week we preached on what happens when God's children pray, and so when God's children give is the title of today's message. I, uh, I, I do appreciate that thought. Thank you for that special uh, from the McDonald family. Do we need him? I mean, really, do we need him? We do. Right, we're like, yeah, 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 we need him. But do you? When did you need God this week? I want you to ask, don't, don't answer loud. When did you actually need him this week? Can you remember? Was there even a moment where you said, Lord, I can't do this? Lord, I, if you're not with me, if you're not helping me, Lord, <laughs> it's not going to happen. And so God delights for us to come to that place of just humble, humble submission and need for him. And when we think about giving, I want to just go ahead and just say something up front. I'm not really talking about giving to the church. All right. Lest you think, oh, he's a Baptist preacher. He's going to talk about giving. Now, I think you ought to give to support your local church. <laughs> I didn't say this, but I heard another preacher say, you know, we've got a lot of welfare Christians. They want the counseling. They want the preaching. They want the facilities. They want the programs, but they want to support it. You say, that hurts. Right? We want everything, but we don't want to, right, give. And where your treasure is, there where you're what? How much money is sitting in your gun case right now? Speaking as one who's a gun case, but right? How much money is sitting in your house right now? I'm not saying sell your house, but how much how much time and effort do we invest in the things that are important to us? You you t- uh, tell me where a majority of your money is spent, and I'll tell you where your heart is. I didn't say that. Jesus said that. If you want, we can go to Matthew chapter six. We can look at that. We can understand that. But there, there are principles of giving, and, and, and I, it pains me as your pastor, because so often I see people just chasing the same cycle financially, and never really realizing that God has some principles for us to follow when it comes to our money, when it comes to our giving, when it comes to our resources, when it comes to our talents. Matthew 6 says, if your eye be single, your body will be full of light. That singleness of eye is the idea that I have, I have one, one purpose. A double-minded man, James says, is unstable in all his ways. And we live in an age of spiritual, spiritual double-mindedness. We want God. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I want some of that spiritual stuff. I want some blessings. But also want to... Right, have this over here, have the world, have my, my pleasures and my way. And really it boils down to, God, I want your will. Lord, whatever your will is, I want that to be done. And I want that for my life, and I want that for my family. And Lord, whatever is hindering that, it, it's done, I'm gone, it's out, of, it's out of the way. I want you more than anything. And when we come to our finances, and we're going to look at our text here today, and the, the, the key to the sermon is this, when God's children give, we experience the joys, number one, of obedience, but we also experience the blessings of God's promises. God's blessings are accessed when we have a cheerful heart of giving. All right? I I don't know why I'm preaching. Some of you are not with me today. You've already shut me off. You've already shut me off. And money is a third rail in in, in churches. More churches have split and have problems because of money than any other reason. And you're you're probably going to get mad at me today, and I don't want you to. I hope to say this in love and care and meekness. But if you want a preacher who just gets up and mealy mouse and is mousy and won't proclaim to you the truth of God's word, if you want an itching ear preacher, I'm not going to be that. I'm not going to be that for you. There, there are a hundred churches within 10 miles of here that you can have that. 
If you want to just come and let your, oh, it felt good to be in church today. Praise the Lord. But if you want to come challenge and say, you know what, man, something needs to change. See, our minds are deceitful. Our hearts are deceitful. And you are sitting here thinking, I've got giving and I've got my finances figured out. I guarantee you, God's word will change your thinking today if you'll let it. It changes my thinking all the time. I don't stand here having this figured out, not one bit. And I'm not going to stand here and tickle your ears. I'm going to give you the truth. And I pray that you've come today saying, God, I need something from you. I need you to change my thinking. I've come to a place, I'm, I'm coming to a place, and, and, and maybe it's just in this moment, in this time of life. We don't have time to goof around. I'm, I'm done goofing. There are people dying and going to hell. You know what's more troubling about me, about Israel, than anything? Is that you have a nation full of people who have rejected God, who are dying in their sins and spending eternity in hell. You've got hundreds of, of, of people that live in Gaza who are dying and going to hell. And Satan is the only one winning here. Come on. We make this all about politics. Understand, it's about souls. God is grieved. You understand this? God is grieved. He's not up there going to heaven going, good job, Israelis. God is not political. Amen. And I'm against terrorism. I, I, it's heinous what the terrorists did. And I condemn it. It's wicked. But understand, God is not delighting at all in the death of anyone. He takes no delight in the death of the wicked. And we have a whole community around us of religious people who are content to remain religious and just go to church and go through the motions. And I'm telling you, Faith Baptist Church, it's infected us. And when it comes to money, we are impacted by this. So I'm just going to give you the truth today. I've I prayed. I had, I, this has literally been my prayer for the last two days. Lord, I want to deliver this in love. I don't want to unnecessarily offend, but I have to speak the truth. What happens when God's children give? Luke chapter 6, Jesus is giving some radical teaching. Have you really considered the impact of what he says here? Brother Rob read it. Thank you, Brother Rob, for switching it up and making I think that's good. We've got to engage our brains a little bit. Right? And so what does Jesus say? And, and we're breaking right into the middle of a sermon here, and I, I recognize that, and so I, I, I want to treat the context carefully. But we're breaking into the middle. They call this the Sermon on the Plain, because in chapter, um, uh, where is it? Um, I think it's chapter number five. The Bible says they were upon the plains, and he began to teach them. And, um, and, and so... It's probably very similar. Jesus probably preached a similar message. His disciples preached a similar message over and over and over again. They preached, right? And they would, re uh, uh, they would repeat what they were given. And because there were many that needed to hear. So a lot of times you'll see the same sermon repeated. And that's okay. A lot of times we just need to hear the same thing repeated. We're a very forgetful people. I don't know about you, but I'm, 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 a, little, I'm a little dense. And a little hard-headed. A little. Just a little. And... Um, Y'all didn't need to laugh at that, all right? Just a little. And, and, and I need to be reminded. And I need, to, I need the same thing to be told to me again and again. And so I think that's what happened as Jesus and his disciples went and ministered. And, and one of these things here is this idea. We, we, we call it the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5. Here's the Sermon on the Plain in verse number 13. And when it was day, he called unto him his disciples. And of them he chose 12. Right? And then he comes down with them, verse 17, and, and, and stood in the plain and the company of his disciples and a great multitude of people out of all Judea and Jerusalem from the seacoast of Tyre and Sidon. I mean, this is, this is amazing, right? You've got them coming from north and south, right? Judea and Jerusalem is the south of Israel. Tyre and Sidon is the very north, even beyond the borders of Israel. And so you have people from all over coming to hear. Uh, they came to hear him. They came to be healed of their diseases. And they that were vexed with unclean spirits, and they were healed. And the whole multitude sought to touch him. Could you, amount, could you imagine that? For there went virtue out of him and healed them all. He preaches to them starting in verse 20. He lift up his eyes on his disciples and said, Blessed be ye poor. For yours is the kingdom of God. And this is all very revolutionary, very, if you want to use a, a modern term, counterculture. 
Because the culture of that day was your religion, right? Your, right? your wealth, your prosperity was a sign of God's blessing. And Jesus says to them, no, blessed are ye poor. For yours is the what? Kingdom of God. Blessed are ye that hunger now. For what? Uh, uh, ye shall be filled. Blessed are ye that weep now. For ye shall laugh. Blessed are ye when men shall hate you. When they shall separate you from their company. Shall reproach you. Cast out your name as evil for the son of man's sake. Rejoice ye in the day. And not just rejoice. He says leap for joy. There's not many, been many times that I've leapt for joy. But there's been a couple times. You ever leapt for joy? Oh, are you kidding me? Have you guys ever, anybody ever leapt for joy? Yes. Right? They did the fist bump. Yes. That's what he's saying there. Rejoice and leap for joy. When? When you are persecuted. When you are reviled for the name of Jesus Christ. Man, I'm telling you, this is revolutionary. He says, that's, that's the best. Right? He goes on, he says this. He says, uh, for behold, why do we rejoice? Why do we leap for joy? For behold, your reward is great in heaven. Again, a heavenly mindset. I'm looking to the future. Eternity is my focus. And in this text, in this sermon, that is the context. He's saying, listen, you're going to face great persecution you're going to face uh, trials. You're going to face tribulations. You're going to be reproached. You're going to be separated from. You're going to be hated for my name's sake. But rejoice in that. And woe to you, verse 24, that are rich. He says, because you have your comfort. What is this? Not Riches themselves are not evil. It's when riches become the focus of our life. And this all has to do with the message. All this context is vital because what we have today, let's just bring this home. What we have today, we are the wealthiest nation on earth. There's never been a nation which is much, much, as much wealth and prosperity than, than us. And you are wealthy. I don't feel wealthy. Okay, you come with, just come to Mexico with me. Come to Zambia and watch families crawl through the trash in their bare feet looking for things to sell. Tell me you're not wealthy. You sit at home in your warm house with your food. We're all, we're all, a lot of us are fat. Come on. Amen. Man camp, I'm telling you, I found a picture of the original Michelin man. By the way, that's an amazing thing. That's what I look like now after man camp. Brother Glover about killed us with food. We had, we had a spread fit for a king. We are so wealthy. And you know, we are in danger. And let's just call it like it is. We have taken comfort in our wealth. That's our security. Because the moment it gets, it gets threatened, ooh, what happens? Ooh, right? All kinds of hand waving. What are we going to do? What are we going to do? What are we going to do? Well, that's your comfort. Now he goes on. He says what? Woe unto you that are, are full, for ye shall hunger. Uh-oh. Woe unto you that laugh now, for ye shall mourn and weep. Woe unto you when men shall speak well of you. For so did their fathers to the what? False prophets. We see all of this, right? This, this concern about maintaining a reputation and, and not stepping on any toes. We don't want anybody to get offended. I'm not saying we unnecessarily offend people, but the gospel offends. The cross is offensive. A Christian who is living for Jesus Christ to the world is offensive and troubling. We're light, and they don't like light. Their deeds are evil. They love darkness. But I think really... If, if I were to evaluate myself, I'm just going to put myself in the crosshairs of Scripture right now. You ready? I think I'm on the second part. I think the woes would apply to me. I think if you're honest, see, the beauty of God's Word is it is truth. What does Jesus say? Sanctify them through thy truth. 
Thy word is truth. How are we set apart to God? How are we fashioned into the image of Christ when we allow the word of God to challenge our thinking? If you're sitting here like, no, me. You, you ought to come away from every message saying, you know what? I was thinking incorrectly or, or wrongly about something and God corrected me. Praise God. Isn't that growth? I don't care how old you are, whether you're 90, 80, 70. I don't care how long you've been a Christian. God's word, our mind and heart is constantly deceiving ourselves. We're in danger of decept, being deceived all the time. Because that's our flesh. Our flesh is opposed to God. And the word of God is there for the believer to constantly challenge us, to correct us. 2 Timothy 3.16. What does Paul say? All scripture is given by inspiration. It's been breathed out by God, every word. And it's profitable for doctrine. What is right? For proof. What is wrong? For instruction, right? Correction, reproof. I'm getting all blah, 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 blowing it all up. Go there, 2 Timothy 3. Right? I mean, we have the Bible. Let's just turn there. Oh, brilliant, Pastor. All right. Some of it's a sake of time thing, I know. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine. For what? Reproof. Shows me what is right. Shows me where I'm wrong. For correction, shows me how to get it right. And instruction in righteousness shows me how to keep it right. That the man of God may be what? Perfect. Not perfect as sinless, but perfect as incomplete. Thoroughly furnished unto what? All good works. And so we see here Jesus, and, and I'm, I'm not going to get through this whole message today, so don't worry, I'm not going to preach for two hours. But, but get this. Jesus here is bringing... And he's showing us where we're off. He's showing us what he expects, what God's children, the marks of, the, of, of God's children will be. You know what? We're not focused on the treasures of this world. We're not focused on finding places of comfort here. We're not focused on just simply having our bellies filled. We're not focused on being liked and well-liked of men and being accepted by this world. No, we are followers of Jesus Christ. All that I have, all that I possess, Every bit of time, every bit of money, every bit of talent belongs to him. And I want to use it for his glory and his honor. Do you see? That's the setting. Then Jesus goes on. But I say unto you, which hear? And that's what I'm a little troubled. I want to make sure you haven't shut me off. Hear what Jesus says this morning. Do this. Love your enemies. Love your enemies. Right? We find uh, uh, commands here given. Love your enemies. Do good to them that hate you. Bless them that curse you. Pray for them which despitefully use you. Unto him that smiteth thee on the cheek, offer also the other. And him that taketh away thy cloak, forbid not to take thy coat also. Give to every man that asketh of thee. And him that taketh away thy goods, ask them not again. And so what do we see here? Jesus is making it very clear. Here's my expectations in obedience. Now, if you were to grade yourself on these, I believe there's five commands here, where would you be? See, when God's children give, they do so in obedience. We see the idea of giving there in obedience to his commands. It's not just an, you know, a suggestion. Hey, hey, if this works for you, you know, it'd be good to love your enemies. He does that understanding nod. Yeah. No, Jesus says, love your enemies. But God, you, you don't understand, Jesus. I mean, they're really our enemies. Great, love them. But, but you, you, they really don't like me. Great, love them. Do you, do you see the command? Do, do you give, do you, is there wiggle room here? You know, I don't know. When I was a kid, I was a lawyer. I should have just been a lawyer. You parents ever had lawyers for kids? Uh, Dad, you didn't use the plural of this word, and so I didn't think that that's what that meant, and so I didn't do what you told me to do, and so Clause A, Section 1 of the parental contract says, right? How often do we treat God that way? 
Well, God, <laughs> I know you said love your enemies. I know you said to give, but Clause 1, Chapter A, uh, uh, Section 2. And God's in heaven doing exactly what you do to your kids. You just shake your head. You say, you know what I wanted you to do. See, when Christians give, when God's children obey. We obey him because we're his children. Because we know and we've experienced his love. Not because we're looking for his acceptance. Not because we're trying to gain more favor from him. No, we are found accepted and favored because of what Christ has done. I've become his child because of what Christ has done. I am so favored and you are so favored and loved by God. I think it would blow your mind when you understood just how much he loved you. And we ought to. We ought to remind ourselves of all that he's done for us and what he's brought into our lives and how he has saved us and his love and care for us. Let us be constrained by his love to be obedient to his commands. We see this facing persecution, facing trials of faith. He says, do this. Love your enemies. Give. Uh, don't, Don't just love your enemies. But he says what? Do good to them that hate you. Like, look, actively look to do good, to to bless them that actively hate you. Not only that, but uh, bless them that curse you. Right? They're they're us they're they're uttering curses towards you out of their mouth. You know what you're doing? Say, you know what? I, I appreciate you. I love you. That'll, by the way, that'll just get, gain more hate. That, that's how hate, right? You heap coals of fire in their head. And, f- and pray for them which despitefully use you. Right? Out of spite. Right? They take advantage of you. What does Jesus say? Pray for them. And, and when, they, when they smite you on your cheek, give them the other one. Say, I'm not, I'm not going to fight. I'm, I'm a servant of Jesus Christ. I'm living for him. I'm serving him. And if you're going to persecute me, if you're going to physically assault me for his name's sake, then so be it. Yeah. See, Peter had it the wrong way. Remember at the garden? He pulled out the sword, didn't he? Yeah. Jesus like, no, no, put that away. And then he heals Malchus's ear, right? This obedience is an acknowledgement of his lordship in my life. Go to chapter 6, look at verse number 46. I'm telling you, I was convicted when I read this this morning. I know I'm bouncing forward a little bit. So he finishes this sermon. He gives them all kinds of instructions and, and commands to obedient to. And he says what? And why call ye me what? Lord, Lord! And do not the things... I say, I I could stop this sermon right here, and maybe ought to, because that's the state of Faith Baptist Church, to some degree. I'm just going to deal with us. We like it when the pastor preaches about all the other churches and the culture. Praise God, amen. What about us? Come on. Again, if you want ear tickling, go elsewhere. It's not going to be found here. And I'm not trying to be unkind. I just want us to be real. Let's just, let's just put it out there. Jesus says what? Love your enemies. Do good to them that hate you. Pray for them. Bless them. Give to them. Don't retaliate against them. Don't just, right, and, and give. And he says, you know what? Don't go around saying, oh, he's my Lord. And you're not being obedient. That's a lie. You don't acknowledge his lordship in your life. You're going around giving lip service to the fact that he is your Lord, that he is your Savior, that, right? Show it. Show it in obedience. Go on. What's he say? He says, Whosoever cometh to me and heareth my sayings and doeth them, I will show you to whom he is like. He is like a man which built a house, dig deep, laid the foundation on a rock. And what happens? As a result of obedience, as a result of responding and obeying the commands of our Lord, when the floods came, the stream beats vehemently upon that house. It could not be shaken for it was founded upon a what? Rock. 
We know the opposite, though. Those who give just lip service to Jesus but have no intention of obeying his commands, what is it? It's a man who builds a house without a foundation. And, that, and all that they do is just washed away. Nothing remains. That's what he's teaching here. Obedience to God results in remaining treasures. In a remaining work. Second, or 1 Corinthians chapter 3, Paul talks about that. He says, our works will be tried by what? Fire to see what sort they are. And I'm telling you today, Faith Baptist Church, let's just get, just, just get real. This is us, okay? I don't care about the other churches right now. I don't care about Arlington right now. This is us. What will remain? What will remain in your life? You say, well, I, I've done really well at work, Pastor. Great, that won't remain. That's all going to burn up. Some of you have beautiful homes, and I'm thankful we have a beautiful home. Very grateful for it. It won't remain. All that time and effort you're spending in making it better. I'm not saying don't care for your stuff, but how much time and effort is spent really focused on things that really aren't that important. We just want it to be nicer. And you have to judge in your own heart whether or not this is what God's will is for your life. I just want to challenge you. Again, what does God's word do? It challenges our thinking. If you want to just sit here and be complacent in the way you think, well, this is just the way I do it. That's not, that's not what God wants from us. That's not what you should want from this preacher. If you want, again, if you want that, this is not where you are going to need to be. What I want to challenge, some of you, right? I mean, you've got hundreds of thousands of dollars in cars and toys I know I'm stepping on toes. I know some of you are looking at me like, your eyes are going like this right now. You know, it's like that Looney Tunes where steam's coming out of your ear. I get it. And, and, I, I'm not, I, and I have this same issue. I don't stand here in condemnation of you. But all of that, it will be just gone. Only what's done for Christ will last. Faith Baptist Church, this building is going to someday be burned up. And it ought to be nice, it ought to be so when people come in, they see that we care and that it's important to us. But this building does not make our church. I've actually, <laughs> this is crazy thinking, I know. Some of you would be like, Arr! but I thought, like, just sell it. Let's go meet in a park. We'll just see how many believers continue to come. You know, we doubled our attendance when we moved up here, and it's because we have a building. I think some of it's because we have a presence and people know that we're here. But I think some of it is like, ooh, they have a nice building and this is comfortable and this works. I'm just, just laying it out there straight. If we just had to meet in homes, would you still come? Well, that's weird. Yeah, tell that to the first century Christians. They were really weird. Right? Tell that to Philemon who had a church in his home. Yeah, Paul thought he was weird. He wrote a whole letter to him. Man, he was a weirdo. Do, do you see my point? We're so invested on what we're gaining here versus what is being done for Christ. You have a nice home, praise God. I have a nice home. I thank the Lord for it. But it's his home. This needs to be used for his purposes. If someone has a need and I can meet it using my home and my property, then guess what? God, give me that opportunity. I want to use it for you. That's the spirit we ought to have. I don't always have that spirit. Amen? I don't. And God has to correct me and rebuke me. And I'm telling you, it's okay to admit it. It's okay. Hey, I don't have that spirit. God already knows, by the way. You're not surprising God. <gasps> you don't? You don't want to serve me with your whole heart? I did not know. You think God in heaven is saying that? No, he's waiting for us to come to the realization. And so when Christian, God's children give, they give so in obedience to his commands. When God's children give, they give understanding that there is a law of reaping and sowing. We see that in verse number 31, the golden rule, as you would that men should do to you, do you also to them likewise. You reap what you sow. If obedience to his commands are not enough, understand this, treat the others as you would have them treat you. I want to go to number three, when God's children give, uh, and this is where I get excited, they model the character of their heavenly father. And see, we see that in verse 32 through 36. 
He says, for if ye love them, okay, so now he's like, okay, let's go ahead and let's challenge your thinking a little bit more. If you love them that love you, what thank have ye? There's nothing to, to celebrate here. If you do, if you love those who love you, don't pat yourself on the back. Oh, <laughs> what a good Christian I am. What thank have ye? For sinners also love those that love them. I guarantee you, you go out and you, you give uh, a bunch of lost people a bunch of money, they'll love you. That's a good guy right there. You guys just out handing $100 bills. Yeah, we love you, man. Can you hear it? I can hear it. You're cool, man. We love you. See, that's a lot of people do that. And we as Christians are like pat ourselves on the back. Like, yeah, you know, I, was, I was loving towards this person. Like, well, they already love you. I mean, you have a good relationship. What about loving those who don't love you? That's what he's saying, right? If you do good to them which do good to you, all right? Okay, they can reciprocate. What thank have ye? For sinners also do even the same. If you lend to those, if you give financially to those of whom you hope to receive, you say, you know what, I'm going to get this money back, maybe even with some interest. It's not, there's nothing spiritual about that. That's what the world does. For sinners also lend to sinners to receive as much again. But here's where, where he says, what is the character of our Heavenly Father? Love your enemies. Do good, lend, hoping for nothing again, and your reward shall be great. Do you see? God has a different economy. And we're living in this world's economy, which the world has a system of structures and rules that we have to abide by, right? Okay? God says, no, I have a different way of viewing money. I have a different way of viewing your talents. I have a different way of viewing your treasures and your time. You know what? You, as a believer, as a follower, as a child of mine, love your enemies. Do good to them that hate you. Lend. Give financially to those that cannot pay you back, hoping for nothing again. And your reward shall be what? Great. And here's where faith comes in. Here's where it says, you know what? Do I believe God or am I living by sight? Your reward shall be great. And ye, look at this. Isn't this an amazing statement? Verse 35. And ye shall be the children of the what? This is what makes us look like dad. If I could use that term. This is what makes us look like the Heavenly Father. When we respond to people not in the way the world responds, but in the way that God has responded. We see God's character. His character, God's love is not reciprocal. Isn't that a blessing? God loved the world, the scripture says, correct? Did he love the world because he knew the world would love him back? No, in fact, quite the opposite has happened, hasn't it? He loved the world, and the world did what in return? They killed his only son. That's the furthest thing from love that you can find. He loved the Jewish people. How did they respond? They persecuted and killed the prophets. They persecuted and killed his son. But did that change the fact that he loved them? No. See, that's God's character. His love is not reciprocal. How often is our love reciprocal? Okay, well, you're, you, Christmas is coming. The goose is getting fat. Amen? You know that song? How often do we give because, you know, well, they give to me. i got to give to them. And this reciprocity, right, that happens at Christmas. And I'm not saying it's wrong, but I'm just saying you see it even in our gift giving. Here's a radical thought. My kids are going to hate me. Take all the money you would spend on gifts and go buy things for people that can't do anything for you. Tim's over there going. Okay, okay, you say that's too radical, Pastor. How about you take half? Just take half. Go from 25 gifts per kid to 24. Do you see what I'm saying? And I'm being silly, but at the same time, we, when we, we, we behave this way, when we give, we do so and we, monitor, we mirror and we model the character of our Heavenly Father. God's grace is not a response to our own goodness. Isn't that a blessing? God doesn't give us grace because, boy, you know what? 
you've been pretty good, so here's some grace. Do you realize God's grace is often just ignored by us? He says that, right? God's financial gifts, think about that. How, how blessed are you? And here blows my mind. Even when we've not used our finances wisely, even when we've not used them for the glory of God, God still blesses us. Because that's his character. Isn't that a blessing? And so when we consider God, when we consider giving, doing so, we model the character of our Heavenly Father. We are children of the Most Highest. It says, for he is kind unto the unthankful and to the evil. That is my God. And I'm thankful that he's that way because I've been evil and I've been unthankful and he's been so kind to me. And he's been so kind to you. And God says, that's what I want to see from my children. This last point, when God's children give, they embrace the promises of faith. See, we walk by faith and not by sight. At least that's what we're supposed to be doing. Let's look at our text. Look at verse 37. Give, and it shall be what? Okay, so that is a faith thing. Because later, earlier on, what does he say? He says, give to those who can't give back. Do you see? Do you see the connection? He says, love those who don't love you. Bless them that curse you. And now he's saying give. Give to who? Come on, help me here. Give to who? Those who can give back? Give to who? Those who? Let's say it again. Give to who? Those who? But then, but, 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 but God, you're saying I should give to those who can't, but then you say give and it shall be given you. Oh. Wait, wait. If I'm obedient to your command, You'll meet the need. It won't be from the people I'm blessing and helping because they can't give back to me. But you'll meet the needs in other ways. And in fact, you may take what I thought I needed, which was the money, and you may bless me with something else in return. Maybe you'll, you'll come along and you'll bless me with, with, with health, with, with help with my family. Would you trade, if, if you could have a, a, a strong, healthy relationship with your kids as they grow up to be adults, how much money would you give for that? I'm a parent. I would get everything. I would live in a tent. If I knew that my kids would, we could have so much. Wouldn't you? And so often we get so focused, obsessed about money about finances, about what we have in our homes and our cars and all the material possessions and our wealth. And God's like, okay, well, you're comforted by that now. If you wouldn't have been so focused on that, I could have helped and blessed in some other areas, but you've taken comfort in this instead of me. See, that's where faith comes in. Faith says, you know, God, I'm going to be obedient. I don't see how it's going to work out. Boy, you know, there are a lot of things I could do with this money, with this time, with these talents that you've given me. But Lord, you've commanded me to give, to give to those who can't repay, to bless those that hate me and curse me and use me. And, but Lord, I don't know. See how, give, he says, and it shall be what? It, I love it. I love the words there. Don't you love the words? Every word is God breathed. It shall be given. You want God's blessing? Be a giver. I'm not just talking about money, and I'm not just talking about the church. I think you ought to support your church family. You ought to support what we're doing here. God knows we need, we need money to do things. God, by the way, God provides the need. I'm not here trying to get your money. In fact, God has provided beyond what we need. He meets at every need. He doesn't need your money. Do you understand that? We need to give. Give, and it shall be given unto you. How? How is this giving? Well, I, I've skipped a verse here. In verse 37, he says, judge not, right? Uh, we, we ought to come away tempered with mercy and humility when we are looking at people and their motives. We should condemn not. We leave the con condemnation up to God. Right? And even when we have to judge, even when, right, we got to reconcile. The Bible says, be discerning, judge the spirits. What does that mean? How do we do it? 
meekness. A lot of us want to get on the old 12, size 12 steel shoe boots and like, wham! Judged. Right? Is that how Jesus judged? Now, there are times he stood and he, he proclaimed some hard truths. But boy, he, especially towards other believers, you never see Jesus harshly treating the disciples. Ever. Now, he said some hard things to them, but he was never harsh. Now, he dealt with some Pharisees, right, the false teachers, much harder than he did his own children. Boy, we go around, and we do, man, we're stomping on believers all over the place. You don't believe like I do. Brr! That is not Christ-likeness. And yeah, we ought to stand for right, and we ought to correct, and we ought to say that's wrong, but with what spirit? Spirit of meekness. When we condemn, we leave that up to God. God, this is in your hands. Vengeance belongs to you, Lord. We forgive as we've been forgiven, Ephesians 4.32. But we, we do so, we embrace the promises of faith with giving. God will meet my needs, Philippians 4.19. But my God shall supply as a result of the Philippians giving out of their necessity. They didn't have it to give, but they said, we want to give a gift to the poor believers in Jerusalem. And Paul said, "What? you know what? God will supply all your needs. He's just repeating what Jesus says. Give and it shall be what? See, those folks in Jerusalem, they couldn't, they couldn't repay. The Philippians were never going to get it back their investment. But they weren't investing in the believers in Jerusalem. They were investing God's money where God wanted it to go. It wasn't their money to begin with. God will meet my needs. Number two, they'll be met in abundance. How does he say the need will be met? I'm going quickly because I want to finish this thought. Good measure. He's no half measures. And, 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 and the picture here is, if you've ever been to a, a third world country, they still do this, where you can go into the market and the grains are, are, are piled up on blankets or some sort of protector on the ground. And so when you would go shopping, it wasn't like you go to Walmart and things are measured by weight and not by volume. You Ladies, you'd bring your pots and your bags and you'd come into the market and say, you know what, I need a measure of meal. And you'd set it down and, the, the, they, would, and they would put, and then they would shake it put some more, they would push it down. And then generally what you would do is you would have that vessel and, and, and the robes at that time would go down and you would, right, it would be an outer garment and you would pull it up and you would tie it in your belt loop so you could hold more. And, and they would push it down and they would pour some more in and then stuff would start to fall out and it would go and they would let you keep that. That was a good seller. And God says, you know what, if you'll be obedient... If you'll follow my word here, if you'll follow my commands, if, if I'm truly your Lord and you're obedient, here's how I'm going to bless you. I will give it back, and I will give it back to you in abundance. And I'm not a name it, claim it, prosperity preacher. I hope you know that by now. There's no Kenneth Hag, Hoagland, whatever his face is, right? There's no, there's Copeland. That's what his name is, right? Because a lot of times what God returns to us is not the money. It's favor and blessings in other areas of our life. And I'm not talking about material things. In fact, the spiritual blessings are so much greater. Like I said, what, what parent, what Christian parent wouldn't give all that they own to see their children follow Christ? And some of you here today, you're sitting in a situation where your kids aren't there and your heart is broken, isn't it? What would you give? If you could pay, what would you pay? There would be no limit, I don't think. See, I'd rather have that. What would you give to be used by God to see people come to know Jesus Christ? What would you give? See, it's in abundance. And number three, how does God do it? He uses the, this world, the men of this world to give back. And I know I'm messing up your blanks. I'm sorry. He says what? Shall what? Men Give unto your bosom. The same men that hate you and persecute you, I'm going to use them to bless you. I love God's economy. And I'd rather have it his way, because it's much more fun. And the fourth thing is this. Our ability to receive corresponds to our carefulness to give. For with the same measure that ye meet with all, it shall be what? Measure to you again. With wholeheartedness we give. Say, God, all of it belongs to you. 
There is nothing that I possess that doesn't already belong to you as your, ch as your child. Whatever. You tell me what, it's yours. You tell me who, I'll give it. But if we come wrong with a half measure, you know, we're like, I don't know if I have my wallet. I do have my wallet. We're like, oh, not a 50. Tw oh, 20, no, no. Ah, I got a $2 bill. Be warm to fill, brother. And God's like, no, I want you to do something substantial here. Do you see the point? I understand, I'm not like prescribing. I'm just trying to get the mindset across. Second Corinthians 9, what does Paul say to the, the believers in Macedonia? He says, God loveth a what? Well, he says to the Corinth about the believers in Macedonia, God loveth a cheerful giver. It's the attitude of the heart. When we're careful to give and say, God, it's yours. It belongs to you. When we're liberal in our giving, and that's a good thing to be liberal in your giving. God says, that's how you'll be measured to you again. But if we're not, what, what does God say? Okay. Lord, I want your blessing. I want your blessing. And this bank account that this debit card represents, because I don't ever carry cash, this debit card represents, it's yours. Every dollar. Now you say, Pastor, do you always? No, I don't. I stand here and with the same, I'm preaching to myself, the same challenge. But is he Lord or not? Are we going to obey or not? I get it. And I, here's what I'm not, I'm not expecting you to come and be like, you know, we're going to have an altar call. We always do. We're going to have a time of prayer. I'm not expecting, honestly, maybe if God's dealing with you right now about this, to just really lay it on the altar and say, Lord, you're right. You may have to go home and think about this. But don't think too deep. Get into the word. When I mean deep, you know what I'm saying? You'll talk yourself out of it is my point. Well, <laughs> pastor doesn't understand. It doesn't matter what I understand. What does God's word say? Take God's word home and meditate upon the truth. And let it change your thinking. And, and it, what the Lord may have you change is going to be different than what he wants me to change. And that's okay. We're not robots. Thank God. It's okay. But let us be believers. Let us be children of the Most High in this area. Let us be obedient to our Lord's commands. And it is radical and it's hard to embrace. In fact, many heard his preaching and turned away and said, this is too crazy for me. Right? You remember that? They made excuses. I got to go do this before I can follow you. And that may be your response. Ooh. But that's where faith kicks in. Do we believe his, his word? Do we believe his promises? Can God keep his word? He can. Faith Baptist Church. It doesn't matter to me what Allen Creek or Northwest or F Fellowship or Bible Baptist Stanwood's doing or what any other church. We have to, we have to look to ourselves. What are we doing? We are the church of Jesus Christ. We are his body. What a privilege to represent him here on this earth. Do you know Christ today? See, that's the character of our Heavenly Father, that he gave his son to die for you. Not he didn't expect anything from you. He's not waiting for you to give up a bunch of stuff or to give a bunch of money before he'll save you. He's just willing, he's waiting for you to just respond to the gift he's already given and accept it. The gift of Jesus Christ who died for your sins. See, because sins have to be died for. So he died for your sins. He paid your penalty. And what you must do is you must receive him as your savior. If you've not done that, you're not going to heaven. If you've not received him, if you've not believed on him and him alone as sufficient for your salvation, then you will spend eternity separated from God. Christ alone saves. He is the way, he says, right? Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the what? Life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. That's in salvation. That's in your Christian walk. Our access to God is through the Son. Do you know him?
If you don't, today is a beautiful day. Today is the day God wants you to respond. He will not force you. He will not twist your arm. But boy, I tell you, he'll convict you. And some of you here today are already being convicted about your sin, his righteousness, and there's a judgment to come. You're going to stand before God and give an answer to why you didn't respond to today's invitation. With heads bowed and eyes closed.